Now we're in the early 1900s. J.J. Thompson was a professor, and he identified an error in Dalton's theory. Um, Now we're going to start getting into scientists that are discovering subatomic particles. So subatomic means inside the atom, subatomic particles, um, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Now, J.J. Thompson had a special experiment called a cathode ray tube, And a cathode ray tube is actually a sealed evacuated glass tube. Now, right now in in this video, you see um, a magnet um, attracting and repelling the beam. Okay? And the beam is going to end up being charged. And we can figure out what the particles of that beam will consist of. Now, you don't need to know what a cathode ray is, but this beam... You saw in this video that this beam was attracted to the magnet and then it was repelled by the magnet. Thompson, uh, when he did this this test, um, typically if the plates were not on, the beam should go straight through and hit the back wall um, right in the middle. But when the deflecting plates were turned on, he noticed that the beam was attracted to the positive plate. So if it was attracted to the positive plate, and we know that likes repel and opposites attract, then the beam must be made of negative particles since it was attracted to the positive plate. The cathode rays were electrically charged. He knew that. He called these particles that were electrically charged corpuscles. He concluded that these corpuscles are present in every type of atom, and he also concluded that they're all identical. We've changed the word corpuscle. We now call it electron. Um, These electrons are negatively charged. They were attracted to the positive plate in the cathode ray tube. He knew that the overall atom had no charge. Most atoms are not going to be attracted to others. They don't have a charge, so the positives had to equal the negatives. That's what he concluded. He also concluded that there must be, basically, I just said, some positive charges to balance out the negative charges. That's why there was no overall charge. He didn't know the exact location of all these charges. So he proposed this plum pudding model, and this is a picture of the plum pudding. It's kind of like eating oatmeal with raisins in it, okay? Imagine the oatmeal is all those positive red dots. And the raisins are all the negative dots. For the plum pudding, it would be the pudding that's the positive, and the plums would be the negative. So he said that the negatives were sitting in a sea of positiveness. The next scientist that actually um, occurred right around when Thompson was was Ernest Rutherford. And Ernest Rutherford was actually a student of J.J. Thompson. And he invested, his main focus was to also investigate the arrangement of subatomic particles. Um, He wanted to actually help his teacher, Thompson. He wanted to confirm Thompson's theory. But what ended up happening was he ended up breaking down his teacher's model, the plum pudding model, with his own experiment. His experiment proved his teacher's ideas wrong. I'm sure you'd all want to do that as well. His experiment investigated more of the structure of the atom, kind of like how his teacher, J.J. Thompson, was looking at what makes up the atom. He got really into the structure, and his results were dead on. This is a very famous experiment. This experiment is called the gold foil experiment, so I'll zoom into this. And basically, that black shield that you see is a zinc sulfide shield, and what happens is the source box would emit a beam of alpha particles. And I will explain what an alpha particle is later. But it would emit this beam of alpha particles. And he originally predicted that most of the alpha particles would go straight through to the other side. And you can see that most of the beams are going straight through to the other side. But what happened when he ran this experiment many times, some of these alpha particles got shot to the side. So like, the ones that I'm showing you here. And then a very, very small percentage shot back towards the source box, very close to the opening where that black 
rim is. And he couldn't understand why the heck would this beam be shot straight back. It should go straight through. Okay, this is going to kind of reiterate what happened in Rutherford's gold foil experiment. So he had a source box right here, and in that source box, he had the element radium, symbols RA. And radium is actually radioactive. And when it decays, um, when it decays, it releases alpha particles. And now I'll, I'll explain what alpha particle is in, in the next slide. Okay, and these alpha particles are positively charged. So you see my blue beam right here, and I put um, red pluses on top. Alpha particles, when the radium decomposes, Decom decomposes, it's going to release these alpha particles. He gathered these alpha particles and he shot them to the metal foil. And that metal foil was actually gold. And that metal foil was really thin. Most of these alpha particles went straight back and hit the back of the zinc sulfide screen. A couple of them would ricochet to the sides and hit over here. So you see how the gray kind of gets a little less intense as you go around. And a very, very, very small percentage um, hit right back here, close to the opening where the source box was starting. If you look at the bottom, it shows you the black was what he expected all of them to hit in the back and in the very back, straight on. What he got was um, a little bit of a fading. It hit straight back, but then it also got a little bit gray, showing that some of the alpha particles um, did not hit straight on. They kind of hit in a, in an angle. Here's a little bit of an explanation of what an alpha particle really is. Um, in this case, uh, Rutherford used radium. So radium is this element right here, Ra. 88 tells me how many protons it has, so that would be like these red balls right here. The white balls are going to indicate neutrons. Um, what ends up happening is um, it's the total mass of the radium is 226. And if I go ahead and subtract the protons from that, I'm going to end up getting 138 neutrons. I just did a simple subtraction. These are the positives and those are the neutrons. And that's in the radium nucleus. What ends up happening is when it goes through radioactive decay, it's going to lose part of itself. And we'll learn more about this as we go along. But here's what I want you to look at right here. That helium atom that comes off, helium is number two in the periodic table. So it has two protons. It has a mass of four, so that means it has two neutrons. So if you notice, here's a proton, here's a proton, here's a neutron, here's a neutron. This whole thing right here is the nucleus of a helium atom. And since it's just the nucleus and these neutrons don't have a charge, then the overall charge of a helium atom is a positive charge. So why am I telling you this? Well, Rutherford collected all these um, these alpha particles from the radium that was decomposing. And since they were all positive particles, he shot that, those positive particles at the gold foil. Uh, alpha, by the way, is a symbol of a fish in the Greek alphabet. So you might see me writing a fish symbol, um, like the one over, over to the right-hand side. To explain that deflection of the particles, Rutherford proposed that the center of the atom contains a tiny, extremely dense, positively charged region called a nucleus. He said most of the mass is going to be concentrated in this nucleus. And he said that from his results, um, he calculated that that nucleus was 100,000 times smaller than the whole di diameter of the atom. So he kind of changed the way that um, the atom looked. And I know this is a little blurry, but if you remember, his teacher Thompson had his, um, his atom looking like this, the plum pudding model. Okay, and it was sitting in a sea of positiveness. So all this was positive, positive pudding, he would say, with his plum pudding. Now you can see that his student, Rutherford, changed the way that the atom looked. He put the electrons all on the sides here. And what he did was right here in the center, he made that the positive nucleus. And the reason why he said that is because when he shot the alpha particles in, some of them went straight through. 
and he would be able to explain that based on the empty space between these. All of these are gold atoms. So this is a gold atom, gold atom, gold atom, gold atom. Okay, Most of them went straight through because they went through the empty space. But a couple of them, what happened, was they got a little too close to maybe some electrons, maybe some electrons that were hanging out in this, uh, this um, area around the nucleus. And if they got close to an electron, they deflected a little bit. They got close to another electron, they might have deflected this way. Okay? It was the very, very small percentage that hit the red dead on and caused it to shoot straight back. So if it hit the red center dead on, it would shoot straight back. And the reason why is because this beam of alpha particles were positively charged. The nucleus he's discovering is also positively charged because likes repel. So if likes repel, then he knew that these were positive alpha particles. He can conclude that this nucleus was also positive. Okay, so that's how he came up with a positive um, nucleus in the atom. Okay, now we are kind of at the same time as Rutherford and Thompson. Thompson was a little bit older, but this guy, Niels Bohr, he worked with Rutherford, and they were um, uh, kind of working in uh, sometimes the same lab, neighboring labs, 1913. Niels Bohr suggested that electrons, he took like Rutherford's idea of that positively centered nucleus, and he, he went further. He took that nucleus, like, his, like this picture over to the right-hand side with the blue and red, that would be the nucleus, and he suggested that these electrons that are negatively charged, which Thompson discovered, he said that they travel in a definite path around uh, the nucleus, and this is like the key for, for um, Bohr, a definite path around the nucleus. He said these paths are located at certain distances from the nucleus. So if here's the nucleus, he said that there's a path with electrons here, and there's a different path and different path, and it keeps getting further and further away from the nucleus. He says there are not any paths located like in the middle here. That's not going to happen. And you also... Um, so it's like rungs of the ladder. You can't have a half of a rung. So um, this green line would not be true. It would only be definite paths that the electrons can be found in. And he also said that electrons can jump from one path to the other. And, um, and when they do that, they get to a more excited state. And then they have to release that energy and jump back down. Erwin Schrodinger and... Werner Heisenberg, they did a lot of different tests. We're now in about 1929. They're all kind of in the early 1900s um, in that 20-year bracket. But he took Bohr's idea and he said, hold on, these electrons do not travel in definite paths. So they're not traveling in definite paths. We don't exactly know the path that they're moving. We can't predict where that electron's going to be. We think that electrons are going to be in regions of the atom where we can most likely find these electrons. And we're going to call them electron clouds. So it's the current theory is called the cloud theory or the electron probability cloud. And you see right here, close to the nucleus, we have more of a high concentration of electrons. And I do E minus for electrons. And so you can see the different levels of the electrons. So there's a, it's a probability cloud. We probably can find them in these regions. And we'll talk a lot more about this, but this is just a vague introduction. Um, this is the current theory of how the atom, we think that the atom is represented. Thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you have a great turkey day.